Continuing with uh, features to support more robust class design. Here's an inheritance hierarchy with a base class and a derived class. And in old C++, um, there's a certain message that's being transmitted by these declarations and sometimes the compiler is able to enforce that message and sometimes it can't and errors will happen. So we have a virtual function f that's a non-const function. We have another virtual function g that is a const member function and we have a non-virtual function h. So um, because these are virtual that sort of implies they're intended to be overridden by the same token, a function that is non-virtual is intended not to be redefined. And it can't be overridden by definition, because the word override only applies to redefinition of virtual functions. So this is really designed to be an invariant over specialization. That's the meaning of a non-virtual function. So let's take a look at some of the trouble we can get into in old C++. First of all, just reading the code down here in the derived class, here is f, it takes an int. Is this overriding something or isn't it? Well, we can't tell just by looking here. We have to look at the base class. And then we can determine, yes, in fact, it overrides that f. What about g? Does this override anything? You might say, well, of course, it says virtual. But in fact, it doesn't, does it? Right? This is introducing a new signature, a non-const uh, non function g which has no relationship to this one whatsoever and there's really no way in old C++ to say this is intended to be an override. It just isn't and that's a silent failure until code and, you know, starts to misuse it. And then of course trying to redefine a non-virtual function is just bad object-oriented programming. There's no good reason to ever do something like this. Well I won't say there's no reason ever but they're few and far between. But the compiler can't detect that as an error. It's legal, in fact, you know, to redefine a non-virtual function, even though it shouldn't be, in my opinion. All right, so those are some of the issues. So C++ 11 um, actually gives you one, a way to deal with each one of those issues. Uh, they're not 100% bulletproof, but at least uh, it, it, it gives you a fighting chance uh, to catch these kinds of errors at compile time. So back in our base class, uh, f and g were, will define the same way, but I'm going to introduce this new final keyword here on the declaration of h, which says uh, it's not meant to be overridden. So yeah, it's kind of stolen from Java. What the heck? It works. Okay, so now an attempt to override that will yield a compiler error. Yay. So that eliminates that problem real effectively. Another problem was we, we were looking at a derived class uh, declaration and trying to determine whether or not it was meant to override. Well, now you can be explicit. The word override right here tells the compiler this is designed as an override. And in order for this to compile, this function must have a declaration as virtual with the same signature up in the base class, which it does. Therefore, this passes muster. And then G, also, we intended this to be an override. We say it, and now the compiler will detect, no, that's not actually an override of a const member function, so that's an error. So final and override here are examples, and they may be the only two contextual keywords. Are there any others, John, that you were aware of? These, these are the only ones I know of. And so clearly there are keywords that didn't exist in C++ 98, so there's probably a lot of code out there in the world uh, where final is used as the name of a variable or the name of a function. This does not break that code. Isn't that cool? Uh, because it's used in this very specific context and it means that. But if you use it as the name of a variable or the name of a function, that's fine too. Trivial syntax question. Is virtual allowed for override? Is virtual allowed for override? Can I just put virtual there because I like it? Um, I see no reason why not, but I haven't tried it. Right, but since virtual is kind of optional for derived, for overrides before, I would imagine it would remain so, but I may be wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's just, it, it's not as important now. I'm used to, I mean, I always right, it doesn't, it, it doesn't convey anymore, it won't convey the useful information anymore because override implies virtual. It's impossible for override to compile without 
this function being virtual, right? So it's kind of just redundant. Well, whether to put virtual on a derived function was, has always been a religious issue anyway, right? Because there's one, there's one uh, argument that says, well, it lets everybody know it's virtual, and the other argument is, but it introduces a new virtual function, and it, it documents that. But it has to be used consistently, right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, you can't argue that it's useful because it's not really giving you any more useful information. This is bad. Yeah. Okay. For this next uh, set of examples, uh, I'm using the class flux capacitor, which of course came from Back to the Future. So uh, here's our class for a flux capacitor. And in old C++, if I've got certain attributes like a capacity that happens to be a complex number, uh, an ID number that's unique for every flux capacitor and that's basically generated from this, uh, this counter next ID, which provides sequential uh, numbers, it's a static variable. So these are our really two state variables and then the static that's shared. In order to properly construct, uh, we often have some redundancy. So a default constructor, a, a constructor that takes a double, a constructor that takes a complex, a copy constructor, you know, all of these will have to make sure that each of these uh, instance variables are properly initialized, so capacity and ID. So this sets capacity and ID, this sets capacity and ID, same here. And anytime you have the same kind of redundant code, you get the, po the possibility of inconsistency, some typos, some errors, some omissions. Um, it just means there's more care required you know, to go through and really validate that. So in C++11, uh, it steals another Java feature, which is one constructor can call another constructor. And therefore, you can consolidate all the busy work, all, all the actual work, into maybe one of the constructors, and all the other ones just call each other. So in this case, the default constructor just fills in a value of 0.0, .0 and calls this one. And the one that takes a double uh, turns that into a complex and calls this one, and this one down here. And we still have the, co the copy constructor, but uh, now we've you know, eliminated a number of places where the ID has to be computed and the validation has to take place and that sort of thing. This isn't perfect. There's little inconsistencies here, but you get the basic idea um, that that's a useful feature. Um, continuing with class design niceties. In old C++, the only time you could actually provide an initialization of some sort of uh, instance variable or even static variable in a class is if it's a const static integral data member. So this was kind of a special case, so you could use that as an array dimension, right? Because you have to show the number before you can declare the array. So if you happen to have a static const integral type, then you could initialize it. You still had to define it outside the class, which was a separate issue, but at least you could give it the value in the class and use it um, for initializing, you know, for, for dimensioning an array. Uh, any other kind of initialization was, was not allowed. So static variables that they're non-const can't be initialized in class. Obviously, instance variables can't be. That's what constructors do, right? So you weren't allowed to do that this way. But now you can. A lot of these things are now valid. Uh, you can initialize a non-const static, and it doesn't have to be an integer or an integral type. It could be a double or anything else. You can actually show an initialization for a plain old instance variable. And these become, well, this one is shared across all objects, but this one for capacity, that becomes the default value for capacity if the constructor doesn't do something different. If the constructor actually does set capacity, then it won't bother doing that. It's not going to do it twice. So the, the constructors, the compiler and the constructors will be smart enough to do it in, in the most logical type of way. And of course, you can still have a static const uh, integral type with an initialization, but that was true before. Okay, so nice little facilities here. Yeah. When does, uh, if I create an instance for class, when does initialization happen? So if you want to debug uh, class creation, well, I, I presume it happens when it would happen ordinarily. Like whenever you define the object in your 
Ah, when does initialization happen? <laughs> Thank <Yes>. you. <laughs> Repeating the question. Um, or when do these special initializations happen? Well, whenever an object is, is defined, right, when, when, it's, when, when its definition appears, that's when its constructor runs, that's when everything else happens. So this is all really an extension of the behavior of a constructor. And it's just going to happen in conjunction with whatever else the constructor does. I, I think that's not quite fair because uh, static initialization of, of fundamental types like int happen at load time. So that's not really true. And I'm very confused by this. And when you told me that this would happen unless something else happened, now I got a little worried because now I have really no idea what's going on. Well, so. what, what this is saying is if you've written a constructor and you have capacity as one of its initializer, then it will use that. But if you don't, it's as if, it's as if the compiler will insert that for you. So this is the default value for the constructor? Yes. Okay, that helps. But then, okay, so then this is... This is happening as a, as a function of constructing an instance of this class. And when it says static there, what, what about that? Well, that's not part of... The, the question is, what about statics? The statics aren't normally initialized when an instance right. is anyway. So that's a separate... So this is... Does that get initialized, though? Uh, can I rephrase the question? If one of my initializers throws, when it will throw? Okay. Well, that's not going to happen because it's an int. Well... I'm specifically saying if it's a static int and it's initialized to zero, if it were done the old way, it would be initialized in exactly one place in one translation unit, and it couldn't be initialized more than once, or it would be a problem, right? It could be defined and initialized in just one place. Well, the one definition rule probably still applies, where if you have inconsistent initializations, you're violating that rule, and that's undefined behavior, or it's going to create some kind of problem. So, think about the physical manifestation of this, because in the other one, when you had the old way, if you defined a, an integral constant in the CPP file, and it, you know, you'd say, you know, whatever this name is, flux capacitor, colon, colon, um, and then what is it, next ID equals zero, that would happen at load time. There would be no question it would start out at zero from the moment the program happened. This one, not sure, because it's in every header file. How does it know which translation you need to do it in? And if the answer is every one, there's a consequence again. Now you, you have to get the linker involved. Well, no, I think, again, that's the one definition rule. The, the, the rule says the initialization has to be consistent across all the translation units. And if you don't have the same value of zero in each translation unit, it's, you know, then, then it's undefined behavior. The, but the, the one definition rule has different uh, manifestations depending on what kind of linkage is going on, right? If, it's, if the linker's doing the linkage versus if the compiler's doing the linkage versus if it's a combination of both, which is the case for template instantiation and inline functions. So here it looks like this is going into that category of inline functions and template instantiation where it's distributed across all translation units and it has to be resolved by the linker. I don't know. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know either. So this, yeah, this is going beyond my depth of, of knowledge of how it's implemented. So yes? I'm sure there's a rule. <laughs> I'm sure it's specified in the standard. And I'm also sure that the ordering is probably specified somehow. Um, but I can tell you that in experimenting with this, it's really complicated. Um, so for example, let's say that you have um, you know, a type that uses the capacity value in the constructor to you know, uses a value. You can't necessarily count on the fact that that private initialization has happened and that capacity is initialized while you're running the other part of the, the other constructor. Really? I mean, it, maybe it's a compiler bug, okay, but, you know, I'm just saying... So there's an, a question about the or dependency on the order here. When you're inside a constructor, how do you know which of these has been constructed? Right. Um, I would hope it would still follow the rule that these are all constructed in the order they appear in the definitions yeah. here. So but you, you would hope, you would the hope. Would be they would be constructed in order and they would be constructed before anything that happens in the constructor. Mm -hmm. Because that's the way I would think you would want it. Something simple that you could understand. I don't know that that's the case. Maybe John or somebody else knows. But that, would, that would be the only possible... I don't think it works that way, though. You know what? C++ is complicated. Yeah. Let's, see, <laughs> let's see if we can get through all of these cool features without getting too distracted by things none of us really understand very well. <laughs> so let me just move on. Um, so here's the feature I think is near and dear to John's heart, right? <laughs> Constructors can be inherited. To give an example of why you might want to do something like that, 
we've seen the flux capacitor class. Let's say you wanted to inherit from flux capacitor and create something that's a red-black flux capacitor, which simply can be either red or black, and have a default initialization of red. All the old constructors would still work if you're not specifying the colors, so why not just be able to use them directly? Why require a user to re-express re every single one of those constructor overloads um, just because it's a different class? So you can just say using base class, base class. And now you've inherited all the constructors from flux capacitor. And then you can add some additional overloads, of course, like a, a red-black flux capacitor that takes a color. And if you really want to have all the other permutations plus color, you can still do it. But now you have the option of just not doing that, relying on you know, the other constructor, or relying on this one to um, in invoke uh, the base default constructor, I guess, is what it would use here. So it, it gives an option of simplifying the rigmarole of having multiple um, you know, carbon copies of base class constructors. And it's such a simple feature, it, it's the one that is like the last to be implemented by all the compilers, right? Do you know if these, this is now supported by any of the major compilers? Or? Yeah, I think Clang, uh, Clang says they're uh, 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 fun function complete. But it's not a simple feature to implement. Really? Uh, I would have thought it would be know, fairly simple. Well, that's my ignorance. All right. I always thought they didn't implement it because it was so simple. They were doing the hard stuff yeah, first and, and leaving this till later because it, was, it would well, be a part piece of, of cake. Part of it is there was a certain amount of, well, I don't know if this is, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, I think it was a certain amount of petulance because you don't really need that feature. You mm -hmm. can use variadic templates to just say, oh, by the way, I want to call the base with these with whatever get called passed to me, I want to pass it on down. And so it was like, why are we going to all this trouble to do this? So, That's interesting. Can, interesting. Variadic templates could is an alternative way to, to accomplish the same thing. Okay, good. So one, uh, when, when teaching uh, from like Scott Meyer's Effective C++ course, uh, there's a lot of examples why things like conversion operators are, are really problematic. Um, the C++ has always supported operator type name as an implicit conversion from the class type to the type that you specify here. And this has an implicit return type of whatever this is, so double in this case. Uh, the problem is once you have these conversion operators, it introduces all kinds of ambiguity. And in C++ 98, there was no way to declare that this has to be used explicitly like certain constructors can. But in 11, you can declare these conversion operators explicit. So that's an improvement. Um, I'm still personally of the opinion it's better to just write a two-double function uh, in the Java style because this is completely unambiguous. When you want to convert a rational to a double, you say r dot two double and that's it. Um, right? So the original spec was really, really opened the door to ambiguity. Uh, in 11, the word explicit makes it a whole lot better, but I would argue maybe it's best not to use it at all. But, you know, that's a religious issue. All right, so now we can move on to some of these larger features. Let's get going. Initialization, lambdas, move semantics. So, limitation of initialization of aggregates. In old C++, you could brace initialize a native array. You could brace initialize a struct, right? And that was pretty much it. You could not brace initialize a standard um, container. In order to initialize a container, what you'd have to do is create an ordinary array like vowels and then initialize a container with a range specified by you know, the, the beginning and the end of the, of the native array. So not really elegant, but that was what you were forced to do. So in, in C++11, the concept of an initializer list was introduced. And an initializer list is really a language feature and it also sort of crosses into the library domain because it, there's lots of library support for this feature. Um, in the source code, when you, in certain contexts, when you use a pair of braces with some numbers uh, or some values inside it, this represents an initializer list object, which is kind of created, initialized uh, at you know, by the mechanisms of the compiler. And then that object can be used as um, the, the value from which to initialize a container. 
So now in C++11, you can initialize a vector event from one of these initializer lists. And by convention, the equal sign is, is typically omitted. Uh, it's, it's not required to be there. And you know, the, I think the idiom is to not use the equal sign, mostly because it's unnecessary. The, the syntax doesn't require it. So initializer list here, clearly this list is used to initialize a vector. But really, the initializer list is like a self-contained initialized thing, and it can be used in a vacuum. So clearly, this is not the initialization of v2, right? v2 already existed. It can only be initialized once in its definition. This is something else. This is an assignment to a vector. But you can assign from an initializer list. So the initializer list initializes itself, and then that initializer list object is used as the source of an assignment operation. This is an overloaded assignment operator for vector that takes an initializer list. Just like there's a constructor that takes one, there's an assignment operator that takes one. Okay, so a little peek under the covers inside of the vector implementation, you'll find a constructor that's uh, declared to take an initializer list, and an operator equals that's declared to take an initializer list. And notice that it's not passed by reference or by reference to const is actually just a pass by value. Believe it or not, that is incredibly efficient. To understand that, we have to talk about move semantics. Yeah? So the second, the v2, where you don't use the equal sign, is that more efficient because you're going straight to the copy construction? The question is, is this more efficient than this? No, these are actually equivalent. The equal sign is completely a, a, uh, you know, a, a cosmetic option in this situation. So both of these use the same vector constructor from an initializer list. What would happen if I put 30u instead of 30? 30u here? Yeah, just uh, I believe that's a compiler error, right? Uh, initializer list has to have all yeah, consistent values. List, it's, it's going to deduce this type and the type has to be the same for it. Yeah. Okay. So you're just, you're, you're locked into the same type there. So here's a function foo that returns a vector of int. Again, this can be made very efficient with move semantics. Um, and then I'll just move right to where this is used. Down here we have a range for, for auto x colon foo. Right? So it's calling foo, and it's actually returning this vector, and then it's going to apply this operation c out x for each x value inside of that, inside of that um, vector. And the vector is actually returned down here, where it's just a return statement with an um, initializer list used to, to return it. So here's an initializer list used in conjunction with insert. So this is a variation of, of a range insert, right, where you insert at a particular iteration, iterator point, and then you provide a range of values. But it's overloaded to take an initializer list rather than a begin and pair. Um, Again, a range for can just have an initializer list as, as the container that it's operating over. And you can actually just return an initializer list. So, so in the, um, that, that's actually, a, that vector is, could be like static. Um, how many times would that be constructed? Okay, the question is how many times would V be constructed? Not, uh, actually, in Which, the for auto, auto X. Or it could be oh, here. So the question is, how many times is this thing going to be constructed? Yeah, I mean, every time this code is encountered, it's going to, it's going to have to re, I presume, re construct that. Or, or maybe that's an optimization or, or quality of implementation issue. I suppose that the compiler can detect that it's not, you know, it's using the same data every single time. It can construct it once and reuse it. I don't know. I'm not sure the language requires that to work one way or the other. Right, because this is an anonymous temporary, so it's probably going to be move. It, it, it's going to be some sort of a move operation that initializes it anyway. And question: um, Would this work for nesting those container types? If you had a vector of vectors or a vector of lists, could you initialize them this way? I don't. The question is: Can you can you have more complex nested initializations of data structures using this? I don't see why not. There. <laughs> okay. So the answer is yes, it works. It's been tried. Great. Not by me, that's for sure. So that was just initializer lists. But there's more about initialization um, that's, that's interesting. 
So old initialization syntax has lots of ambiguities and confusing aspects. To really illustrate this, let me just go through these examples and show where there's potential confusion. So first, I'm saying create a dynamically allocated int and initialize it to 10. So that will return a pointer to int. Fine. I can also say new int. What's it initialized to? Well, nothing. So that means uninitialized. So it's got garbage in it. If I put an empty pair of parentheses, now it's default initialized for whatever the appropriate value is for an int. That would be zero. So this zero initializes an int. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. If I say int v110, this is a non-dynamic. It's just a, an automatic object I'm initializing with the value of 10. If I attempt to initialize v2 as an int with an empty parameter list, I figure, well, this meant default initialization for int. So this should be default initialization for int, right? Mm -hmm be nice. No. So the syntax here actually says this is a declaration of a function called v2 that takes nothing and returns an int. Isn't this uh, the most vexing parse? It's, it's a relative of the most vexing parse. Um, it, it's basically a reflection of the rule that says if you can interpret, if the compiler can interpret a piece of code as either executable code or as a declaration, it's going to choose declaration. So in this case that's a declaration even though it's also you know, you can also make the argument it's an initialization, but it's not. Not as far as the compiler is concerned. What's this? Int foo bar. Depends on whether that bar is a type. Or right. We don't know, right? If bar is a variable, this is an initialization. If bar is a type, this is a declaration. We can't tell unless we go looking up what bar is. Int i initialized from 5.5. Okay, that is definitely an initialization. Unfortunately, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to write this because we're initializing an integer from a double which it's going to be truncated to, f you know, to 5. So this initializes i to 5, which is legal. Double x equals 10e19. Great. Initialize an int j from x. Perfectly legal code. Okay? Not pretty. Not useful. But the compiler is obliged to put something into that int. In 11, we have uniform initialization. From now on, when you, when you initialize something, use braces. Just always initialize things with braces. That's all. If you do that, all of the advantages that I'm about to show you kick in. If you don't use braces, you don't get the advantages. It's that simple. So new int initialized with braces. Great. That's just an int initialized to 10 int v1 initialized to 10. That's an int initialized to 10. The braces mean initialization. This can no longer be a declaration. New int, okay, it's still a dynamically allocated int with garbage in it. v2 brace brace, now this is an object that is you know, constructed with the default value appropriate for an int. So that would be a v int v2 equal to 0. What's this? Well, if um, bar ends up being a type, this is a declaration of a function. If you say the same thing with braces, it's an error because you can't initialize an int from a type. So good, you get an error message. Right? If you wrote this, you clearly were under the impression bar was something you can initialize from. Since you can't, you get told about it rather than having foo you know, be something completely not what you expected and the error showing up later and being completely gobbledygook. Um, here's our x. It's a double with a high value. Int j initialized from x. Error. Right? If you use brace initialization and narrowing would have to occur, that's a fatal error. Same for i being initialized from a double. If you have truncation that would have to happen, that's an error. Question? Yeah. What if it's what if it's uh, 5u or 5.5 as okay. a float? Question, what if it's 5u five, yeah. or 5.5 5 as a float? 5.5 5 as a float clearly would, would still be an error here. 5u, mm -hmm. um, I would guess that would be legal because an int and an unsigned int are going to have the same bits and it, doesn't, it but, won't be a truncation. There's a, there's a narrowing possibility. No. No, yeah. Because it's a literal, there's no narrowing. Oh, the compiler okay. can know 
if you said 5u, that fits in an int, there's no you're right, you're absolutely right. In other words, the, the regular and unsigned version of anything are always going to have the same number of bits. So what, what if it's a variable, then an unsigned, unsigned variable? Then narrowing is possible. And then what would it do? It would be a compiler. So it will, if, it, if, it, if it's not guaranteed to fit, then it'll speak? I think so. I think so, yeah. Now, in C++ 11, is this a hard error? Because I know when you do it the old way, it's just now a warning. The question is, is this a fatal error? Yes. It's meant to be real hard-nosed. Hmm. <laughs> Leor, yes. I just want to make one quick comment about that. I, I agree with you. I love brace initialization. I also love auto. They do not mix well. Yeah, there's a problem with auto and brace <laughs> initialization. <laughs> And I guess that's a, a story in progress, right? Well, I don't know that there's anything you can fix it. But the, but the problem is, if, if I were to say auto i brace 10, I'm looking at that. I'm assuming that I'm creating an integer uh, i with the value of 10. But that's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is I'm creating an initializer list with a single item. In it. Yeah, there's ambiguities when. <laughs> When the compiler sees what could be interpreted as an initializer list, but you didn't intend it as that, and, and all, all hell breaks loose. Yeah. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, I, I, unlike John, I've cast my lot to with auto. I'm going to use auto everywhere. I'm going to use brace initialization everywhere, except where I'm wanting to use auto. OK. Um, so good point, then. So you're going to use auto and not brace initialization? Is that what I heard? Or are you going to use brace initialization and not auto? It, if depends, it depends on what I'm looking at. Okay. You just can't mix them together. You got to figure out which one you're going to use. All right. Yeah, so there's always a there's always a catch. All right. So problem algorithms are not as efficient when used with function pointers as with other types of uh, of objects, and that's because inlining will hardly ever apply to function pointers. If you have a function called isPause and you pass isPause as a uh, as a function object here for the find if algorithm, then that's probably going to actually pass a function pointer and then the expression n greater than zero won't be able to be inlined in this situation. So um, there's several solutions to this. In old C++ you could use these bind second and greater predefined function objects and you actually do uh, get around using the function pointer except these are just hideous. So, um, function objects, you know, were a, the next sort of generational improvement on this. You, if you use a function object and pass an anonymous instance of a function object, then the code can be inlined and it's, uh, it's pretty efficient. Um, the drawback, however, here is that the functionality is separated from the point of use. So, when you're reading this code, uh, you see something called isPause, then you're going ha to have to look up the source code of this you know, implementation if you don't remember what it actually does. So it's efficient, but it still is kind of awkward in terms of reading the code. How and is different from inline? It seems oh, this is inline. This is inline. But no, no, no. I'm saying before, I mean, the inline function was in the same position on the screen as the struct. I didn't see how it's any less separated. You mean with... Yeah, with that's this sticking up at the top of the screen. Well, in, remember, I'm just showing, the, pretend this is, you know, in a different translation unit. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah, if the f compiler actually sees this code, it can inline it here. But I'm talking about the general case where this is just some separately linked function. That was my point. Yeah, okay. You said it was physically separate from where you're using it. I thought, I thought it was about the same distance. Do you see what I'm saying? On the screen, it was about the Oh, as here, yes. yes. But, but what I'd like is to actually not have to go look it up anywhere. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. So I'm kind of developing the, the next feature we're about to look at. I was like, wait a minute, it's yeah. in the same place. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't really comparing it to the last slide. I'm just saying it's not ideal because there's a separation between the use and the implementation. So lambdas are C++'s answer to this particular issue. Uh, we can say find if and give it our iterators and then just put an anonymous function object which ends up actually generating the exact same code as if we used a named function object like this, actually a named class with an anonymous function object like this, but the actual logic is placed right at the point of its use. So this is like a use once 
and discard um, function object. Except it's not really used once. If this is in a loop, you know, it's used multiple times. But it's used once per <laughs> this location in the source code. So the syntax is a pair of square brackets sort of introduce a lambda. And then the rest of it, you know, kind of looks like the rest of a function definition. You've got the parameter list, and then you've got the body of the function. So it's really the square bracket to say what comes next is an anonymous function object um, with this as the function call operator's implementation, and um, you, can, you can specify it right at the point of its use. Herb loves these. In fact, he made a statement, lambdas make the existing STL algorithms roughly 100 times more usable. Roughly. Reduce the return type of the function? Um, yes. Or you can specify it. In this case, in this case there's no, you have to use trailing return type, your favorite. But in this particular case, we don't need to, to declare it because it deduces it. If there's just a return statement, it, it figures it out. Question. Can the lambda function have access to variables defined earlier? Can the lambda function have access to stuff that's in scope? Yes. And we'll look at that in a second. Okay, that's a capture list. You end up specifying that in here. So I just wanted to kind of get, get you to, to accept that this is an anonymous function object. That's exactly what it is. And it's just a notational convenience. Okay, there's no performance benefit of this over naming a class and then writing an anonymous instance of that class here. You get exactly the same code generated. So any local, any global variables, the, the, the code in the Lambda can just get to. There's nothing magic about that. But local variables, are, they have to take special effort. So if you have some local variables like target and epsilon here, um, and you wanted to access them inside of a Lambda, so this Lambda, for example, will test some value to see if it's equal to target plus minus epsilon. And this is an example out of one of Scott Myers' courses. And so the implementation is to take the f absolute value of target minus val. If that's less than epsilon, then this thing satisfies, right? So we're basically partitioning a sequence between begin, begin and end based on whether or not each value um, satisfies the, you know, the, the, the uh, condition of being equal to 4.9 plus minus 0.3. In order to have access to target and epsilon, we have to list them here in this pair of square brackets. So when there's something in here, it's called a capture list. I guess if it's empty, it's an empty capture list. And that captures these variables. Now, if you believe me that this is an anonymous function object, you'll realize it's a piece of code that kind of sits over here, so it, it has no access to target and epsilon. By putting these things into the capture list, you're actually adding things to the constructor. And you can't actually write the constructor, so you're basically you're, you're controlling the behavior of the constructor by providing these capture list items. And then when the anonymous function object is constructed, it'll copy the values of target and epsilon into itself, and then it has access to them when it executes. So this is copying by value. We'll see other ways shortly. Question. That was it? Okay. Um, and you can see the output there. Okay. So there's variations of the capture. If you don't, if you don't put anything on the, fa on the capture variable, that means capture by value. If you put an ampersand, it means capture by reference. So you can have any number of uh, variables in the capture list and any combination of ones that have an ampersand and ones that don't. Um, so for example, variable one is captured by value, variable two is captured by reference. You can also specify default modes. An equal sign means everything is captured by value. And then you don't have to list them all out. It'll just figure out when you use the name, if that's a local variable, it'll be as if you listed it up here without the ampersand. If you say ampersand, it's as if you listed them all with the ampersand. You can also have a default with exceptions. So <laughs> equals means by value except for variable one or, or the other way around. Reference? Pardon? Can you do const by reference? Const by reference? Const variable I don't think const is part of the syntax. It's just, this is read only and read write, essentially. It's either copying or it's going to be a reference. Yeah. If it's copying, then 
the original is, is, is secure and there's a copy that you can mess with in the Lambda. If it's by reference, you're actually changing the object that's out there. Be careful in concurrency situations, right? This gets dangerous. You know, it's a lot safer to capture by value than by reference if you're dealing with multi-threading environments. And, but that's a topic for advanced multi-threading. If, if you're copying by value, um, you said it would deduce what is actually used in your Lambda. Does that mean that it would actually, when it creates your function object, you said you said prior that uh, it's like capturing um, in the constructor of your function object if you actually specify the variables. Uh, would it only actually copy the values that you're using? Yeah. Right. The question is if you if you just said let's say bracket equals, and you didn't specify target and epsilon, it would only copy values of target and epsilon into that function object because those are the only ones you're naming in here why would it bother copying others yeah, yeah. it would just figure it out yes so, so it's almost if you're going to be if you're going to be copying by value uh or by reference as a general rule and, and there's no exceptions it's almost always better to just put the equals or amper, ampersand I, I think this is comp the question is is it always better to use one or the other i think there's no simple general case for this it's complicated you got to look at it on a case by case basis and you will find that you're jumping around and doing it different ways question it doesn't seem to be any value in listing them explicitly if, it, if it'll just figure it out for you just decide whether you want equals or ampersand and you're done Question, why bother listing them if it's easier to type an equal sign than it is to type these out? It becomes a documentation benefit to show which ones you're actually caring about. But that's what auto's for. <laughs> but this isn't, <laughs> but this isn't auto. <laughs> Question. But I, but I think in their case, those, the function that you actually have can be more complex, and you may not have meant to have a global name in that space. So you type another variable name that you meant to be local in the, within that function itself and you didn't declare a type, and all of a sudden you're referencing it on the external Right, language. so that was an example of how you can get into trouble by not listing out the names. Listing out the names is always better. It's like using, it's like using the using declarations versus the using directive, right? You're always safer saying using standard C and using standard C out, using standard C error, than it is to say using namespace STD. And I think the same sort of thing applies to, uh, for listing out your names. But it's a religious issue. Or if it isn't one, it will be in a few years. <laughs> So those are the capture modes. One pet peeve, <laughs> I want to be able to say equals variable one, damn it. <laughs> and, you, and apparently that's not legal. So that's my pet peeve. It makes sense to be able to say equals variable. If I can say ampersand variable two, I can say equals variable one. I don't know. Someone decided that wasn't cool. Okay. So lambdas as local functions. Ah, so you can actually use, okay, talk, speaking about auto here, okay, um, uh, this is a slide I added, and I actually forgot what I was trying to do here, so <laughs> give me a minute to remember. Bool within epsilon bad. So here's an example of within epsilon where, geez, what am I doing here, John? I'm trying to declare a function inside a function. Oh, thank you, yes. I guess I should have read my own bullet item. Yeah. So yeah, so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I saw this somewhere, now, this is cool, I should talk about it, I already forgot what it was. So yeah, of course in C you can't have a function defined within a function. Um, you can have a struct within a function and then a function within the struct if you wanna go through that trouble, but you can't directly put a function in a function. You can, however, directly put a variable that initializes from a lambda in a function, and you have exactly the same effect. So within epsilon here is just like what I'm trying to do with within epsilon bad. I'm trying to have this thing I can call as a function that takes val and tells whether or not it satisfies this condition. And then I can just call it within epsilon 5.1. Is, is auto here supposed to be bool? No. What is auto supposed to be? It's the type of the lambda. It's the, yeah, because this is a lambda. It's actually the type of the lambda, and you don't want to know what okay, that I, type I, really I, is. I, I, okay. I'm not going to. I just, no. Oh, cool. okay. In fact, it, I don't think there is anything you can put except auto. I don't think there's a legal syntax for how to declare a lambda. Say STD function. Okay. 
but, but you know, okay. Hold right, 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 right. But actually, that's less efficient than auto here, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I'm not saying yeah. it's better. I'm just saying you could. Standard function is very, very flexible and not, you know, inlining goes away pretty much with it. So you want to avoid that unless you have to use it. Anyway, this is just a cool thing. I'm one among many. So uh, there was a, an article Herb Sutter posted about generic lambdas, and I thought it would be worth talking about. Um, so here's a vector of shared pointer of strings, and I want to be able to sort that or something. Um, right now, you know, lambdas have to use a fixed type, but perhaps in C++14, it'll be possible to uh, have a generic declaration for how the lambda works that would just apply to any old type that, that is the data type of that container. Uh, so right now, that's, that's not legal. Right? You actually have to spell it all out. Anyway, in the future. Okay, so we're ready to move on to the next big topic. And to me, this is like the most fascinating topic in C++11. Um, as an old kind of compiler hacker, uh, it's stuff like this that fascinates me. And uh, it really solves this one really uh, egregious problem that C++ has always had, which is that certain things are just really inefficient and the copies are being made all over the place when there's really no good reason for them. So some people might choose to you know, use a different language because they can avoid all that copying. Like they might choose to use Java over C++ in some case, because in Java everything's just a reference. Uh, and copying is really, you have to bend over backwards to copy something in Java. So anyway, in old C++, objects are or might end up getting copied when you really don't need or want that um, functionality. Uh, compilers are smart enough to eliminate the copying if the situation is simple enough for the compiler to figure it out. So the return value optimization is, is really more than an optimization. You kind of assume that all half-decent compilers can do it. And it's a way of avoiding the extra copy by basically you know, hacking a function to take hidden magic arguments that point to where the results are going to go. So you don't have to actually hand it back, you just construct the result back in the memory uh, space of the calling function. And that works, it'll work in very simple cases and even less than very simple cases. But it's not guaranteed and there's a limit to you know, when the compiler can apply that type of optimization. So let's set up a situation where we see you know, expensive operations being, being performed. Here's some class that's big, and we don't know what's in it, it just has lots of data. Some kind of binary large object. A function called make big that returns an anonymous big object by value, the definition according to the language, the semantics here is an object is being constructed, then it's being copy constructed, and the caller gets a copy of that object, then the original is destroyed, but then the copy that was returned back to the caller gets used for something, and then that gets destroyed. Technically, that's what the compiler says has to happen. The as if rule means that will almost never really happen, but in some cases it might, because the compiler just can't optimize that all away. If you have a function like operator plus, um, it can accept its arguments by reference to const. That's pretty canonical. But the return value pretty much has to be by value. There is no other way to do it and have a sane implementation. And you can run through all the possibilities. You can pass by return by pointer, return by <laughs> reference. You just can't make those work. And if you make them work, it's not worth the trouble. All right. So calling make big may cost up to two, uh, three constructors and two destructors, and then BT can go on being used. You need at least one object constructed, obviously, but there's going to be lots of excessive co uh, construction and destruction. When we add two of these objects together, um, you know, there's probably an extra copy of the return value um, that was created and destroyed before this code can continue running. Again, if the RVO is applied well, that won't happen, but you can't always rely on that. So how do you solve the problem? Um, return references, return pointers, no, th those just don't work. Return smart pointers, okay, you can make that work, but there's going to be some overhead involved of managing the smart pointer. If it's a shared pointer, for example, there's reference counts that have to be dealt with, etc. Uh, it's a step better than forcing a copy of an object that doesn't have to be copied, but uh, we can do better. And the way we can do better is to kind of step back and look at a particular scenario. If we know the returned object is a temporary, that it's never going to be used for anything except what it's being used for right now, then we know that any data that it encapsulates, it contains, 
will no longer be needed after it's copied out of the object. So we can then take that as a special case and say instead of actually copying, we can move that data from the source to the destination because the original owner won't care if it's missing. In order to be able to identify those situations, it took a new language feature. And that feature is the R value reference. First, let's just do a little bit of terminology. And I didn't used to have this, and I realized you've heard these terms, L values, R values, you sort of know what they are, but they take on a special meaning in C11. It's really important to have a pretty good understanding of, of how they're being used. So an L value is something you can take the address of. Um, I'm sure there's always exceptions, but that covers most of the cases. Uh, they may or may not actually have a name. For example, an expression like star pointer doesn't have a name, right? It's just whatever the pointer points to. And that thing has an address. Obviously, pointer is pointing to it. The address has to be representable. An R value is something you can't take the address of. Typically, they have no name. Examples, literal constants or temporaries of various kinds. So whatever you used to think about L values and R values, something about left or right of an equal sign, forget that. That's maybe true still in some cases, but this is a more important definition of these two terms in order to do what we're about to do. All right. So C++11 introduces a new type of reference. And it's declared with a double ampersand as opposed to the single ampersand. What used to just be called a reference in old C++ is now called an L value reference, and it continues to be exactly the same thing as it used to be. The new type of reference is called an R value reference, and it can only be bound to unnamed temporary objects. Okay, the only way to make sense of this is to go through a bunch of examples. So let's do it. Here's a function fn that returns an int by value. Here's an int i, and here's an old L value reference to int, which is bound to i. Okay? Nothing new yet. Here is an r value reference, which is bound to the temporary 10. That's fine because 10 is a temporary, right? It doesn't have an address. It's, it's just a temporary value, anonymous temporary value. Here's an attempt to bind an r value reference to an l value. Won't compile. What makes this an L value? Well, it has a name, it has an address associated with it. Here we initialize an R value reference to the result of the expression I plus 10. That's okay. I plus 10 is a temporary expression. Clearly it doesn't have an address, right? It's the result of something that has an address having 10 added to it, but not modifying it. So that value lives somewhere. We can't ask where that is. It's a temporary. We can have an R value reference to it. The function fn returned a temporary int. Therefore, it can be used to initialize, I'm sorry, it cannot be used to initialize an L value reference. It could have been used to initialize an L value reference to const. So this was always true in the old C++. If you have an L value reference to const, basically the compiler will go and create a, a location somewhere to throw this in, and then this will be a reference to that location, and it keeps track of that location. And as long as the reference is, is still alive, the, the location will be valid. And when this reference disappears, so will that location. So the compiler handles all that for you. Okay. And finally, we can have an R value reference to the temporary that Fn returns. Fine. Fn returns a temporary. <sighs> How's everybody doing? You have to understand this to understand what follows. Okay? So even if you don't get it now, you'll have the slides, you can download them. Mine are actually up on the website already. You can look this over, you might need a few more times. Let me tell you something. The first time I learned about our value references and move semantics, I was sitting in a class Scott was teaching. He was actually doing an early version of this course that I have the, the actual book for here. And I was just an enrolled student. And he talked about it, and I sort of got it, and I go, yeah, that's really cool. And like two days later, I knew that you could do something with temporaries, and that's about all I remembered. Uh, I, I really you know, couldn't write code with it. So some time goes by, 
and I'm attending a conference in Boston. Dan Sachs and his son um, gave a talk. He's actually, his son did the talking and Dan kind of kibitzed. Uh, and it was a, an hour talk on our value references and move semantics. And that was like the first time I'd really seen it again since the, the seminar I did with Scott. And when they were done, I said, yeah, now I get it. And then a week later, it was all something about double ampersands and moving and did, I couldn't write code with it. I still didn't get it. I'll show you the thing that finally made it make sense to me. It's not this yet. Okay, but when we get it, I'll, when we get to it, I'll show you. Uh, yes. Can you take an address of a value? Can you, uh, well, it works just like an, the other kind of reference that way. When you take the address of a reference, what are you taking the address of? The thing it refers to. Okay, no operator operates on a reference. And that's true for both L, and R, L value and R value references. What the, what's the only one thing you can do with a reference? Initialize. initialize it. That's it. Once you've initialized a reference, the reference name becomes an alias for the object it's a reference to. If you apply any operator to it, you're applying to the thing, not to the reference. Yes, but can you take the address of the temporary object? The point point there? Because it doesn't have Sure. Yeah. <laughs> that was I, I believe you can take the address of an R value reference and can't you? Ooh. Well, that, well because you said, which is a, <laughs> it does, except once you've got it in the reference, the compiler obviously has to be able to manipulate that object, so it does have an address for the purpose of that operation. I haven't actually tried to take an address of an R value reference variable. I would guess it works. I might be wrong. And if John doesn't know, it can't be that important. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you actually, I haven't actually seen any code that actually does take the address because you're just dealing with this object. You're not really like asking where it lives. You don't really care, right? Okay, let's move on. So C++ has always had the copy operations, which together are the copy constructor and the copy assignment operator. It still has them. There are two new operations, the move operations, the move constructor and the move assignment operator. They are declared like this. Notice, first of all, there's no consts in these declarations. That's quite important because the purpose of these operations is actually to move stuff out of one object and into another. Well, if you're moving out of something, it changes. You're not copying out of it, you're moving out of it. Whatever resource that old object had, at the end of the move, it will have been gutted. Okay, it is left as a husk of its former self. Basically, the old object ends up as a default, sort of morally equivalent to a default constructed empty object. It's still a valid object. It, you know, it, it satisfies its invariance. It can be destroyed, but it has no useful payload. That payload has been transferred, and that's what these functions do. The, copy, the move constructor transfers the payload off of this thing into the object being constructed. The move assignment takes this payload and uses it to initialize the object we're assigning to. And the old object ends up basically eviscerated, is the term Scott uses. Both should be no except, I haven't harped on that, okay, but in a perfect world, move operations are no except. Okay, so now there are six canonical functions in every class. The original four, the default constructor, the destructor, the copy constructor, the copy assignment operator. Now we also have a move constructor and a move assignment operator. Okay, in this implementation of big, I'm fleshing it out a little bit because I want to show you some interesting aspects of this. So let's say that a big object contains a blob, some binary large object. And let's say just to make the example interesting, it also contains something that has no, you know, expensive attributes, a double. Let's say blob is a, some sort of resource managing type. So instead of just being, you know, a wrapper for an array, maybe it's like a string or something where it has dynamic um, as attributes associated with it. So there's some complexity there. And we're going to look at what happens. So operator plus will take two bigs by reference to const and return their sum, assuming it makes sense to add bigs. Um, we have some other function called munge that takes a reference to a big and a reference to a const big and then 
returns another big that's some modification of the original. So this kind of implies there's a, uh, a copy operation involved to create a, a new object. And then we have return uh, a make big that just is a factory function. So in, in C++11, factory functions actually can be written as returning by value, which makes them uh, semantically very simple. Right? They don't have to return a pointer or some smart pointer or something. They can just return the value of the type being, being created. And then as long as you know, this operation will, a move operation causes that object to be assigned to the, to the destination, it's going to be efficient. So a caveat. I have comments here to talk about how many objects are created. What I'm really meaning here is how many full objects are created. Um, I showed this slide to Scott Myers and he actually complained that this, it's false because there's actually two separate big objects. Yes, I know that there's going to be more than one object, but there's really only going to be one full scale construction where all of the dynamic allocation and the blob and everything are created. Um, and that's what's important here. So let's see what happens. We have two separate big objects. Clearly each of these is a, a separately created big. And here we have a third one. So now if I say A equals make big, one actual big is created. And that's this right here. This default construction is the one creation. The assignment to A is going to be employing the copy, um, the, the, the move assignment operator. Okay, so the move assignment will basically transfer the guts of this return value temporary and, and place that data into A. If I say big BX plus Y, again, one actual object is created. It's the one that's created in the addition operator. And it has to return that, but it can return it by moving it. So that object will be moved, constructed into B. A equals X plus Y, again, it's the, assign, uh, the addition operator that creates the object, returns it. It's returned using move assignment and assigned into A. When I say mung x plus y, now there's two objects. The x plus y creates one, and then mung itself creates one as well. We don't know what's going on in here. So you know, at some point, there's, it can't always be optimized to just one object. It, it depends on the context. Um, and then if swap is implemented uh, appropriately, there's going to be no objects created whatsoever. So we're going to focus on that last piece because that's, that's the implementation detail that finally made move semantics make sense to me, to look at swap real closely. So let's do that. Just one quick one. Yeah, could sure. Quick question. Written, could you have overloaded the munge to take an R value reference so that it could pick up the temporary from x plus y? Yeah, of course. I mean, if you write a function that takes an R value reference, then the only way it yeah, then it, yeah, and, and it, if it can, then it'll choose that one. So if you actually pass it a temporary, it'll use it, and if not, it'll use the other one. Well, that's exactly what you get already with the six functions, right? There's move, move constructor and copy constructor, and it'll use move when it can, otherwise it'll use copy. And that's not, that's not limited to, you know, classes and their class definitions. That can be in any context. That rule, th those set of options will be followed in that order. So let's look at swap. So this is an implementation of, C, of the old C++ swap function template. It's part of the standard library. And the only way you could swap two things in old C++ is to copy them. So if I have references called X and Y, I create a temporary that's a copy of one of them. I then copy the second one to that first one that I copied out of, and then I copy the temporary into the second. There's three copy operations. This will always work, but it's expensive. And it's going to unconditionally perform deep copies on those objects. So that's really the problem with old C++ is inside of the standard library, when a vector reallocates, there's a whole lot of this copying going on. Right? When it's copying elements from the old memory to the new, copy, 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 copy. And when you're swapping, copy, copy, copy. So people would look at that and say, well, I'm just going to use Java. I don't have to worry about copying, right? OK. When objects have move support, then the copies will go away. Let's understand why. Here's an implementation of C++11's swap. Now this replaces the swap on the last slide. So in a C++11 environment, that old swap doesn't even exist. There's only one swap. This is it. 
notice that it still has the same declaration. It sort of has to because everything in the world uses it. If all of a sudden every piece of code uses a function with a different signature, things would be out of hand. So it's, it's the same function, you know, the same interface as far as callers are concerned. But the implementation has something a little extra. Move. So what is move? Think of the word move as a static cast to an R value. If you think of it that way, that's pretty much what it does. It takes this expression and it treats it as a temporary. Now, what is this doing? It's copy constructing normally, but if this is something movable, if it's a temporary, then it's move constructing. So this says, just trust me, compiler, this thing can be moved from. And then it applies the move constructor if it exists for that class. Now, if the type T doesn't have a move constructor, it'll still do the copy construction. So it just says prefer the move operation if it's available. Then the same for moving Y into X, and then move the temporary into Y. The result is no objects have been created. Everything's have the guts have just been shuffled around. If these are all strings being swapped, it's really just copying a pointer to care, copying a pointer to care, copying a pointer to care. Well, you know, maybe some additional state. But that's basically what happens, is it's a shallow copy. And that's the most efficient copy you can have in order to do a swap. So move is just a zero cost function, meaning cast to R value, cast to temporary. All right, so let's see how this works with big. And by the way, this is where my discussion of move semantics ended last year. And there were a lot of questions after that. So I've added a little bit more here to sort of try to illustrate what really goes on. And I think I'm correct with this code. It was a little tricky. I've gone over it a bunch of times. But there's still potential. If anybody sees a bug, just let me know. But I think it's pretty close to being correct. So here's the implementation of the move um, constructor and the move assignment operator for our big class. So remember that big has as its instance variables a resource managing object called of type blob. It's kind of like a string or something. And then a primitive. <coughs> so how do we move construct a big? Well, the resource managing type, right, we have to, we have to trust that it's movable so we say move from B of RHS, the right-hand side, RHS, into B of the big we're constructing. Now, the double is trivial. Right? There's, it's just copy the double. There's no moving of primitives. It's just the copy operation. So what happens here? Well, if the blob class has a move constructor, it's used. And if it doesn't, it you know, falls back to the copy constructor. What about assignment? So move assign into big from another big. Well, we move assign into the sub-object B from the source object B. And then we just do a normal assignment of the double because there's nothing special for primitive types. And again, it'll use move assignment if available for blobs and it'll fall back to move uh, to copy assignment if it's not available. You get a return. You a return. Did I forget a return? Yeah. Oops, thank you. <laughs> I'm so focused on the moving, I forgot the basic requirements of an assignment operator. Thank you. That needs a return start this, obviously. Uh, any concerns yep. about aliasing? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> Only if you try to move to yourself. As I said, any concerns? This is contentious. <laughs> That's actually a really good question. If we're talking about copying, then it's easy to say, well, you know, either you check for self-assignment or you don't. If you're doing copying in sort of the idiomatic way, which is, well, that's a... Yeah, assignment is usually implemented in cop is copy and swap on modern 
designs. And you can do copy and swap without checking for self-assignment. The only potential is a performance hit. You won't have, a, you won't have something corrupted. Is it possible something's corrupted here? Um, yeah, it's a good question. And my initial thought is it's going to follow the same pattern as, you know, as copy assignment in terms of if it's implemented right, there's at worst a potential performance hit. Although for moving, not even that, right? No, it's, hmm. it's, it's dangerous and this is a contentious issue. Okay, um, so obviously Howard someone's thought about it. Howard recommends that you not check. Okay. Because Howard's saying the whole point of move is to be as performant as possible and if you add a check, you may be doubling the cost of the operation. Yeah. Right? But what, but if you, and if you think about it, you cannot self-move yourself without realizing it. Because by definition, the thing you're moving from is an unnamed temporary. That can never be you. You know that. Hmm. What you couldn't do, what you can do though, is you can say A equals move A. Right? Right, and if you force it, then you're potentially in trouble. Right, and so that's where you, if you're doing a move, you need to be responsible and realize that a move on top of a move can be dangerous. Okay. But as you point out, in some cases, if, you're all, if all you're doing is moving a uh, pointer, it seems like, oh, well, that's safe, except that you have to clean up what you're moving from and set it to zero. Well, we're going to see that next. Yeah. There's a reason I added blob as a secondary object, so I can show that in the next part. But at this level, you don't have to worry about what happens in the move operations. You just rely on there being move operations for your sub-object. And now let's look at the final bottom level here, which is what about blob itself? It also has to have appropriate move operations. So, for, did you have a question? I did. Okay. Uh, it's in regard to blob, um, it's, if, if blob is not in your control, and it doesn't have a uh, uh, move semantics, then is it, is it correct to assume that doing uh, making a move constructor was just pure evil at that point? If it, no. like, Won't it revert to copy and then it'll just be inefficient? What's beautiful about this is if you, don't, if you don't own blob and there's no moving in blob, it's not doing anything wrong. It's, it's, it's going to be a copy. But tomorrow, when the blob author updates blob, yeah. your code automatically gets advantage of right. this. So you don't need to know whether it's there. So the question is, do we have to worry about blob not supporting move operations? And the answer is no, we don't have to worry about it. Everything just works. It'll, it'll be correct just... It'll be correct either way, and it'll become more efficient when blob does get move operations, which, by the way, look like this. So here is blob's copy uh, move constructor, and so it's going to replicate the raw pointer resource. This is just a, you know, a primitive copy operation of a pointer, so there's no danger here of any kind, no possible exceptions. And we zero out the source pointer to make it a null pointer. And as a null pointer, when it goes and gets destroyed, it's a no op, which is good. Um, and and it, the object doesn't actually necessarily have to be destroyed. I mean, a, a piece of code could actually go and assign it to something, and that would work. So typically, it's going to be destroyed if it's really a temporary. But in the case of swap, right, um, it's very possible that the move cast is, is, is not really dealing with a temporary, but just a normal named object. And later on, it'll have normal you know, copy operations applied to it after all those moves happen. So. Um, you know, you, you don't really know. But in this case, we're, we're zeroing it out. We're leaving it sort of an empty husk of its former self. And it, it's basically good for nothing but destroying or reassigning if that happens. Um, move assignment. All right. And here we are checking for <laughs> self-assignment. So I guess, uh, according to Howard, I shouldn't be doing that. But anyway, I did do it probably because, you know, better safe than sorry at this point with how much I know about what's, how these are really used. So we release the old resources of the object, right? Then we, and by the way, this is a non-throwing operation. Uh, if there's a god, delete will not throw an exception. Then we replicate the pointer and we zero it out. So we again leave the old object as a husk of its former self. And uh, once again, I forgot return, didn't I? Yes, I did. At least I'm consistent. At least I'm consistent, if nothing else. And no except, right? And I didn't bother with the no accepts because you can spend a long time talking about those. But basically, all move operations should be no accept. So yeah, no accept, no accept. No, so, right? That's no. why it was invented. Yeah. And I'm just, I can't do everything here. This is an overview. <laughs> this is an overview. OK. By the way, 
the double ampersand doesn't always necessarily mean R value. So Scott Myers coined the term universal references for certain contexts where the double ampersand is used. And specifically, it's when it's used in a template, in a deduced context. So this is a very specific set of circumstances. You've got a function template where the type T is deduced. If you declare a, a, an R value reference to T, where T is a template parameter, this should be capital, sorry. Uh, it's a template parameter and it's deduced. Then this is not necessarily an R value reference. Actually, it's something that behaves either as an L value or as an R value reference. So for example, if I have double pi equals 3.1, if I say auto ref ref x, this, by the way, is a deduced context. When, when the compiler has to figure out what auto means, that's deduced. So x, in this case, is an R value, because this is a constant. On the other hand, if I say auto ref ref y equals pi, pi is clearly an L value, so this is an L value reference. Same exact syntax, one is an R value reference, one's an L value reference. Isn't that funky? Yeah, it takes a little getting used to. Um, now, instantiating the function template, f of 3.14, it's an R value reference. f of x, you know, it's an L value reference. f of pi, L value reference. What's x? Ooh. Down, down, up, up. I forgot. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's an R value. Yeah, so this would still be an R value reference because it's an R value here, but f of pi would instantiate f of double, which is an L value reference. So you actually get this one piece of code that can generate either L value or R value references for what, um, for what val is based on the object that's passed in, the <laughs> object that the function is specialized on. So one of the points of this slide is that function template argument deduction has the same rules as auto and vice versa. It, those are basically both deduced contexts for <coughs> those variables. So even though you, if you put like a type on the auto, it would fail to compile with pi, auto ampersand ampersand y is equal to pi, even if, if you had like a, a double on that, it would fail. It would well, you can't mix auto and double. Well, I know, but type pi is of type double, and you're you're basically assigning um, an L value uh, an L value um, to uh, whatever an R value reference. Well, that's the whole point. This is a magic syntax in this context that doesn't mean R value reference. It means whatever type of reference is appropriate for this expression type, and it and it and it becomes one or the other. So it'll actually be a real reference. Right, it'll be, well, it'll be an L-value reference. Uh, R-value and L-value references are both real. <laughs> it's just, they're different. Okay. If you replaced auto in both cases with double, the first one would compile, and the second one wouldn't? If you place auto with double, in both cases, double ref ref x, this would be okay, this would not, yes. Okay. Yep. So it's the auto, the magic auto. Uh, the magic auto here, yeah. Uh, the type deduction. Yeah, so there's one more, one more slide, we'll be done with this. In order to understand what was really happening here, there's a rule called reference collapsing. The first time I read about this, I really wished I didn't have to understand it. <laughs> However, it is a useful thing. The, the, this is really something that is a result of what used to be called the reference to reference problem in old C++. You can't have a reference to a reference. Things just you know, went haywire and didn't compile. But in C++11, you can. And you can have these four permutations of, lef, of R and L value references. And if you have a, um, you know, a reference, an L value reference to an L value reference, that's an L value reference. An L value to an R value, is an L value. An R value to an L value is an L value. All of them are L value except an R value to an R value reference. That's an R value reference. Okay, so I think it's uh, STL, Stefan Levove at Microsoft, who said that the L value reference is greedy, so it'll always, it'll always dominate, but if there's no L value references, then the collapsing is always an R value. And that's what makes everything in the last few slides kind of make sense. And this is the real rule in the standard. And the, and the thing that's universal references is just something Scott made up. And it, it, serves a pro, it serves the purpose of explaining something in a way that is kind of practical. But really, it's a way to hide the complexity of reference collapsing. So it's a way of kind of tying the real rule with the Scott rule. 
They're both useful. And Scott himself says, if you've watched any of his recorded talks on this, what I'm going to tell you is a lie, but it's a useful lie. And the real truth, I'll tell you later. And this is the real truth. So, all right. Okay, so back to our big object. Um, remember we have a blob and a string, right? Um, we have a bunch of different constructors. So here's a constructor for big that takes a reference to a const blob and a reference to a const string. And then we have one that takes two R value references to these two things, and then an R value and an L value, and an L value and an R value. And as you can see, that even for just two different contained types, there's like four different combinations. What if there were three different contained data members? In order to have all the possible combinations, you'd end up with, you know, eight different constructors, then 16 for, yeah. There's this exponential combinatorial explosion of different specific orderings you'd have to specify if you want all of them to be as efficient as possible. So that was a problem. That problem was solved with a combination of various features of the language. And um, yeah, so rather than showing you the solution, the, the solution is a mechanism known as perfect forwarding. What we'd like is for each of those objects in the list of parameters to be passed on in the way that is appropriate for it to the various operations that are involved. So instead of having a move, uh, cast, which was appropriate for, um, you know, for the situations we looked at earlier. Now what we want is a way to specify for each of these object, for each of these parameters, for it to be passed on to its appropriate constructor in the appropriate way if it's an L value or an R value reference. So again, these are universal references because they're in a deduction context, right? They're a template. This is a uh, a member template. The constructor can be a member template of a class that's not a template. That's fine. Or it can be a template too. Let's not get into that. So the member co template constructor, then this is a deduced context and these are universal references, right? And the forward then is just this magical wrapper, it's actually a function, but it's, it's this magical operation that will result in this being an L value if it was an L value passed in, and being an R value if it was an R value passed in. And the same for the other parameter. So now, if these classes support R, you know, move semantics, it'll use them. And if not, it'll just revert to copying. But we don't have to have this combinatorial explosion number of constructors anymore. So that's perfect forwarding, in a nutshell. I had a question there, because you lost me on that last uh, thing. I thought you said by default, in move, if it didn't support uh, the move semantics, then it would default to uh, copy. That's correct. If a class like blob does not have move operations, then this forward will always be a copy operation. It will always be a copy constructor. No, I'm not talking about the template. one previously, when you just used the keyboard move. Oh, okay. In that case, too, it falls back to the copy constructor. That's true. So then what's the use of this? Because this is able to deal with different possible actual parameter types. Whereas in that situation, we just always assume we want moving, if possible. In this case, we might not. If the parameter was an L value, we don't want moving. So if we put move there, we'll force it to always use move, which is wrong. Okay. In this case, we wanted to use the appropriate operation for whatever was passed. And that's what forward is designed to do. Wouldn't this work without forward, though? Because you said in the template. No, because no. And, and this is an, OK, you, you're making me have to tell you one more rule that will confuse you. <laughs> because it sure as hell confuses me. And that is that if something has a name, it's an L value. That rule is universal. If I didn't have forward here and I just said B2, B2 is a name. It'll always be a copy operation. It'll always be interpreted as an L value. Even though, it came in as a Even though it came in as something else, it becomes an L value here if I just said B of B2. Because it has a name. The type is R value reference, but it is an L value. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way it is. So in order to get around that, forward solves the problem. Don't ask me how. 
<laughs> See, John. Yeah, John wants to explain that. I've got another question. About okay. That. Doesn't the template there open up the possibility for like exposing constructors that you didn't want possible? Say, for instance, if Blob had a constructor from double, but you didn't want big to be able to be constructed from a double and a string, all of a sudden there's a big constructor from double and string. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but you could specialize that for double and then and then not and then prevent that from compiling with a static assert or something like that. Or delete. Or delete. That's more elaborate than I've actually thought about this so far, so I don't know. All right. So how does the library take advantage of this stuff? We're not really talking about the library yet, but just kind of since we're talking about move operations, most um, library components are move enabled. So if there's a context where they need to be moved, they will be much more efficient. Um, some are move only. And if you were to talk about concurrency this morning, you saw a bunch of thread type stuff that's all move only. Um, unique putter, for example, is a type that can be moved but is not allowed to be copied um, because it's a unique putter, right? So if you were allowed to copy it, it wouldn't be unique anymore. Internally, many of the components, containers, employ moves whenever possible. So again, the example is like a vector. When it has to reallocate, it runs out of memory. Um, when it allocates the bigger chunk of memory and then it transfers stuff, it'll use the move operations to move all those elements over rather than copy. So much more efficient. I don't know if anybody has ever thought about something called the rule of five, but it sort of occurs to me there should be one. Um, who knows the rule of three? Has anybody heard of that? Yeah, so the, the rule of three is a, just a general truism of C++ that if you find yourself having to write either a destructor or a copy constructor or a copy assignment operator yourself, chances are you need to write the other two. If you think about it, like if there's a pointer involved, right? Generally speaking, you don't want the compiler to generate those. You want to write your own. So now we've got the rule of five. If you need to write any of the five, you probably need to write the other four. And there's rules actually now that say if you write any of them, then the compiler won't generate any of the others, except that there's a little bit of a conflict with the old rules of, um, well, the, yeah, the old, Let's put it this way. The original rules for old C++ about when certain functions are generated have been deprecated in C++11. And it might still happen, but you shouldn't count on it. So if you're going to write in C++11, if you need to write any of those five operations, you should write the other four yourself. End of story. If you don't, something funny might happen. You might get certain functions not generated that they're supposed to, or they'll be generated and do the wrong thing. Could I make a suggestion that, that maybe you don't mean necessarily writing them, but possibly suppressing them? You have to address them. D addressing them, thank you, yeah. What I mean is you have to mention all of them. Right. And it may be to say equals delete, thank you. But, but you have to at least, you have to tell the compiler exactly what to do in each of the five cases. Agreed. Okay, that's really what I meant, thanks. So a good style says, if you declare any copy operation, move operation, or destructor, you should declare. See, I said it right here. I see you it. should declare all five. And um, OK, so this is what I meant. The copy operations are still generated by default if needed. This is the, be I'm, I should have just read my own slide. This is the behavior that's deprecated uh, in C11. So it still does it. But you sh by doing this, by following this rule, it won't matter, because you will have trumped this rule down here. And that's good. Okay, so this is kind of an interlude. There's certain things the old standard didn't have. It had no GUI support, no garbage collection, no finally blocks, no concurrency. Well, there's still no GUI or finally support. Um, as far as finally support goes, that's you know a a purposefully omitted feature. Um, it just doesn't like sync well, doesn't mesh well with the philosophy of C++. As far as GUI goes, well, maybe it'll be a a technical bulletin or something soon. Uh, the ABI now exists, so you can actually implement garbage collection if you choose to. 
But the most far-reaching thing that wasn't addressed before and now is, is concurrency. And so this is kind of a segue into the topic of concurrency. Um, how many of you attended the concurrency talk this morning, just out of curiosity? A good amount of you. And how many of you have never seen anything about concurrency at all? One person? The videographer. Okay, so that tells me that if I have a choice of like skipping something, this would probably be the best section to skip. Of, of all the stuff covered in my talk today, there's really only a few that are covered in other talks here, and concurrency is the main one that seems to be covered in at least two different talks. And then there's a talk on enum classes and, and universal reference, not universal, um, uh, conversion rules, where, you know, not allowing invalid conversions. That'll be addressed by somebody else. Uh, but because there's a lot on concurrency, what I'd like to suggest, since we have about 20 minutes, is let me just kind of skip the concurrency stuff right now. Let me just move to the library. Yeah. Well, you can look at the slides. Um, okay. And if we have time after this and people want me to go back and do it, I'll do it. But this, this is stuff you will not have seen in another talk, so I thought it might be a better use of the time between now and six. Okay, so we'll look at some new function and function object facilities, smart pointers, array, hash base containers, and general rules about how those optimizations, uh, how the optimizations we talked about apply to these containers. So all this stuff came from Boost, of course, because Boost is Boost rules. So we know templates can be written to support anything that acts like a function, right? Here's a typical uh, algorithm. Uh, find if that takes this thing called type pred. So what's type pred? Well, specifically we don't know. All we know is that in the implementation of find if, it's going to use p as if it were a function call. It'll say p open paren and pass some parameters. Right? So this is a completely generalized way to specify um, what this functionality is. It can be a function pointer and then it'll work, albeit not very efficiently. It can be a function object or a lambda and it'll work a little bit more efficiently. But how can we extend that generality so that it doesn't have to be a template parameter to an algorithm but it, just a general purpose object that can represent anything callable? And, and that's the, the problem. All right, so the solution is this thing called standard function. Here's an ordinary function called string length. We can represent it in a specialization of the function uh, template specialized for something that has the signature that string length does. So string length takes a reference to a const string and returns a size t. So this is a reference to a const string, but wait a minute, it returns an int. It doesn't even have to be exact. It just has to be close enough for government work, and you can do it with a function. With a function. It's kind of nice. I mean, after all, size t and what's the difference, right? It's all the same thing. So, um, you know, we know it's going to work. All right, so now we can say fn equals string length. So this just declares this thing. It doesn't actually associate it with string length yet. It's just an object that's sort of waiting to be um, representing some callable entity. And here the callable entity is the string length function pointer. So we can use that to call a string length function. It could also be the length member function of the string class. And that works as well. Of course, if you looked at the length member function, you'll see it actually does return a size t, right? As opposed to a, an int, but it just works. Or it can be a lambda. Here's a lambda that takes a reference to a const string and returns, well, whatever that returns. And that works too. So then if you, if you assign that to something that doesn't have a signature of const string, you will get a compiler error? Um, yeah, if it's not convertible, if, if something about it isn't close enough, you'll get an error. So, you know, obviously the return type can be different from what you've declared. Like, you declared it as an int, it can be a size t. As far as reference to const string goes, there's probably some conversions that'll apply. Off the top of my head, I can't tell you what they would be. Um, if I took a, uh, if I had a function that took a pointer to const care or something, right, that might, there might be a conversion that would work in that case, so it would, it would apply. So you have to kind of mess with it. But it's designed to be forgiving. Uh, it doesn't have to be an exact literal match in, or, in order to work. 
Um, but there's a price to pay for that. There's a performance cost to using function because it really is just going to be a pointer internally of some kind. So there's no inlining. You can't take advantage of inlining of the lambda, for example. You know, but functionally, it's useful. All right, so if you ever worked with the STL in, in old C++, um, you know, it had some useful features, but they were really hard to use. So you don't really want to write a function called greater than five. That's kind of a special purpose thing, right? You'd rather just use existing tools that are in the library uh, so you don't have to create a whole brand new function to just return whether some number is greater than five. So you can use bind second and the standard greater than components. I think this example was similar to one shown earlier. So this takes standard greater than, which takes two arguments, and it binds the second argument to five, which means this becomes a single argument function, which is an appropriate thing to pass to find if. And so it basically tests every value in range to see if it's greater than five. Right? You could have done it with this, or you could do it with this. So uh, in the old days, the, the, you know, the, the, the wisdom was it's better to do it with these because you don't have to create a new function. Right, yeah, you do get a performance benefit from this, thank you. So if it's an actual function pointer, it's always going to involve an indirection, whether th whereas this is probably going to be inlined. Anyway, there's some drawbacks here. You have to have an adaptable function object and all that. So it means you have to have these funky base classes in your, in your objects when you create them. So C++11 has a kind of a, a one-size-fits-all bind operation that uh, eliminates the need for both a bind first and a bind second because depending on which of the arguments of greater than you're binding you, you have two different um, tools to do that. Now there's just a single unified bind. Uh, so I can take greater int and I can bind so that the first argument to it becomes the so, so that the parameter to the function object that this creates becomes the first parameter to greater and five becomes the, the second. So basically find if is going to be passing a sequence of values to this thing and those values are going to be represented with under bar one and for each one it's going to say under bar one greater than five. Is that true or not? So I can, you know, if I wanted to do um, the reverse, I could say 5 comma under bar 1, which would be testing if 5 is greater than that value, right? So I just need a single, single object to do that. It turns out you can do it with lambdas, and many will say lambdas are better. Well, that's a, they're more, they have better performance, I think, because I think standard bind is going to copy that uh, argument several times. I'm not sure about that. I mean, that may be true. I just don't know. Yeah, it behaves like boost bind. Okay. I think the other argument is, is that, that lambdas are just easier to read. Right? That's, like I said, a lot of people just say use lambdas because it's, it's pretty straightforward. And it's going to be efficient. Anyway, those are your options. Um, resource leaks. So how many of you are already pretty familiar with the whole idea of RAII and how that, okay. So really, there's, if there's one sort of philosophical change in C++ over the past 15 years, not counting C++11 features, but just in C++98 idiom. Um, it was a move from using raw pointers in the early days to avoiding them like the plague uh, as much as possible in modern times. And in order to avoid them, you have to have an alternative. Right? So if, you don't, if, if you're not using raw pointers, what are you using? And C++98 provided only one alternative, which is auto pointer, and we'll look at that in a minute. The reason raw pointers are bad is because when you start using raw pointers, um, to use them properly with dynamic memory, you allocate memory at one point, you do something, and then you release the memory. But all kinds of things can happen in here that cause these release operations to be skipped. An exception could be thrown, somebody could put a return statement in there, forgetting that they you know, haven't deleted their data yet. All those kinds of things can happen. It becomes really a matter of uh, maintenance of the code and, and code review and all of that. And the bigger the system, the more the chances that these things are going to get messed up. So rather than using raw pointers, a smart pointer or an RAII object, Bjarne 
you know, coined this phrase, resource acquisition is initialization, and he's been apologizing for it ever since, with the caveat that he still hasn't thought of a better word for it, but you know, that's what we call them. So it's basically a class type where the initialization of that object is, is, is the association of some dynamically allocated resource, and the destruction of that object is the release of that resource. Generally, there's exceptions. In order to make this work, the allocation of the resource and the association with the RAII object has to happen pretty much atomically. Like there, there can't be a way to separate the allocation and the initialization. And it's really easy to create scenarios where you end up with these resources being leaked before they're actually associated with the, with the resource managing object. And that's a little beyond what we have time to talk about. But you know, in this case, that's not an issue. We're just doing a new end that's either going to throw an exception or it's going to succeed. In, in neither case will we have a corrupt auto pointer. So if it throws an exception, we just bail. If it succeeds, then we will associate this auto pointer with that resource. So this is the only C++ 98 uh, resource managing class provided in the library. Uh, it served the purpose of you know, making it so that nothing that happens down here could cause uh, the leak of that resource. If an exception happens down here, this must be destroyed before we propagate the exception, it'll be deleted. The destructor will apply delete to that. Uh, if somebody executes a return statement, same thing. The compiler guarantees that thing gets destroyed. Cool. So that's the bright side of auto pointer. <laughs> if that's all you use it for, that's great. Unfortunately, uh, it's easy to, for auto pointer to get you into trouble. Uh, if you happen to allocate uh, a single object and then you um, let it you know, get destroyed, that's fine. But if you allocate an array, auto pointer doesn't know. Because after all, the type of this expression is pointer to int. What if it was just new int? Pointer to int. It's, the type is right both ways. But this is an array, which means when it's destroyed, you have to use you know, delete bracket bracket. But auto pointer doesn't know that. It'll use the single object form of delete, and that's undefined behavior. Will it work with an array of ints? Maybe. Um, with an array of some more elaborate type, you're almost certainly going to at least get a memory leak, but it's undefined behavior technically, which means anything can happen. All right, so a lot of problems with auto pointer. So auto pointer has been deprecated in C11 because now that we have move semantics, we can do auto pointer better. And it's been replaced with unique pointer. Unique pointer is just as efficient as auto pointer, meaning it's free basically. Uh, auto pointer costs nothing. Uh, unique pointer also essentially costs nothing. But it doesn't have a lot of these other problems that, that, unique po that uh, auto pointer did. And I didn't even talk about some of the other problems. With, when you copy an auto pointer, it was actually a move. Copying an auto pointer had move semantics before they were invented. <laughs> but you had to know that. Right? When you made, made a copy of an auto pointer, you were actually moving the object from the source to the destination. So unique putter always has move semantics. That's all it supports. If you try to copy a unique putter, like after associating this resource with WP, uh, you're not allowed to assign uh, an object. Wait a minute. Oh, you're not allowed to assign um, one of these unique putters. It's, it's just, it's going to give you a compile error. Um, okay, so we have an initial unique putter that owns this widget up here. And then we have a default constructed unique putter that's not associated with anything. WP2 equals get widget 2. You can copy as long as what you've got over here is an R value. So remember, get widget 2, right? That just returns an R value. So you can do that. But if you try to copy one unique putter over another, it won't compile. So really, all it has is move semantics, no, no copy semantics. Uh, it works for arrays, but you have to remember to specialize for an array. At least it's better. With auto pointer, you couldn't even do that. Okay, with unique putter, if you remember to specialize for an int bracket, it'll work with an array. I believe it'll actually give you an error if you get it wrong. So if you fail to put the brackets here, but you do this, it'll give you an error. And vice versa. Right? I think, I think it's smart enough to know that. I think I tried it. So this will give you an error, right? It's not an int, it's an int array that you're instantiating. 
And unique putter also supports the shared putter's custom deleter. So normally, um, to release a resource, when it goes out of scope, it just applies delete to it. But some types of resources, like file objects from the old C library, they don't have destructors. Instead, to release a file resource, you call fclose on it. Well, you can specify that. You just have an additional template parameter with the declaration of the deleter or the releaser, and then you provide the releaser as an additional argument. <coughs> so both unique putter and shared pointer uh, do that. Caveat, with unique putter, it's more expensive if you provide a custom deleter. It's, it's really efficient if you don't. It's like auto pointer. If you provide a custom deleter, there's a little more overhead. But if you need it, you've got the option, right? You don't pay for what you use, but sometimes you do pay for what you do use. And that's the way it is. So, uh, the next is the shared putter, which has been around for a long time. And this is my one graphic of the presentation. I was proud of it. <laughs> it took me about an hour to make this look good. So, the, the whole idea behind a shared putter is that each object has an associated reference count. Each shared putter shares both the, re the, the resource and its associated reference count. So in the, in the simplest case, if widget uh, is an object that has an int and a double in it, then there's an int and a double here in this widget. If I say shared putter of widget, and I say new widget, it creates the widget. It also creates a reference count equal to one, and the shared putter now has that reference count associated with it. If I were to take that shared putter object and push it onto a container, then the reference count would become two, and now you've got two different shared putters pointing to this pair of things. You've got the original one, and then you've got the one you've pushed into a container. And then if you push it into another container, the count becomes three. But it's basically doing a shallow copy of, uh, you know, of, of these attributes. So that's, that's pretty efficient. And then as these things go out of scope, the reference count reduces. When the reference count becomes one, and then that last object goes out of scope, only then is the resource actually destroyed. And by default, it'll use delete, and you can also provide a custom deleter, like with unique putter, and it'll apply that function to it when it goes away. So that's your basic vanilla shared putter. Um, there's an optimization of it, called um, make shared. If you use make shared to create your, um, your, your shared putter, it actually allocates the object itself and its reference count in one integral memory allocation. And I, I don't know, but I'm guessing the shared putter itself and all this stuff can be allocated in one big chunk the first time. Uh, does anybody know for sure if that's possible? No? Okay, I guessed wrong. So at least these things are allocated together in one memory allocation. Because the shared putter itself, the thing on the top, yeah. you make many copies of that. And it, that one there might go away before the other. Right, one. but I'm still thinking that, yeah, I was, I was still thinking this is in one, you know, the, but then there would be a, yeah, okay. That could be in the program. Okay, I was biting off more than I could chew with that guess. But anyway, this, these two objects, instead of having a separate um, instantiation, because this would be one memory allocated chunk, and then the shared putter itself is another memory allocated chunk. At least those two are, are allocated in one mm -hmm. integral chunk. But you still have a separate shared putter pointing to this chunk. And so that, that saves you know, memory allocation overhead, time and space. Does everybody realize the cost of default memory allocation? There's several words of overhead every time you allocate anything. Um, it's, it's worse than that in multi-threaded programs. Yeah. Because, because the, the heap is a global resource. You mm -hmm. have, it has to be thread safe. Okay, which means you have to be able to lock it. Which means there's locking twice, once for the reference count, once for the widget, yeah. Can't hear, him. Can't hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I forgot the question already. <laughs> um, yes. All right, so that's shared putter. There's a lot about shared putter out there. Howard gave a talk that lasted about an hour and a half last year just on shared putter and unique putter. So this is really just scratching the surface. Um, array, with array, b array basically acts like you take a struct and you stick a native array in it. And, and by doing that, you make a first class object that you can copy around. Right? You can't copy a native array because it turns into a pointer. It decays into a pointer. So the, the standard array is just a 
uh, notational convenience that saves you having to write a struct and sticking an array in it. And it also behaves kind of like a container as much as possible because you can use begin and end on it and that sort of thing. But it's not really a general purpose container because you can't insert. It's a fixed size. So an array takes a type and a size and it stays exactly that size forever. So it's no less efficient than a native array, but it's a first class object so you can copy it around by value or by reference, whatever. Um, right? And with this, there's no real reason ever to use a built-in array, which isn't to say people are actually not going to, but you don't actually need to anymore. Um, templates can be nice and generalized now. You can write a template called minimum, el minimum element right, that takes some sort of a container and returns uh, an iterator to the element with the least value, and you can apply some standard algorithm, and it'll work whether it's a uh, standard container or even a standard array, or in fact a native array. It'll work in all cases. So that's pretty generalized. All right, so here's an example of using this min element function template with a uh, vector and with a native array and with a TR1 or a standard array. Whoops. So one of the sets of uh, tools that didn't make it into C++ 98, mostly just because they ran out of time, was the hash-based associative containers. So set, multi-set, map, and multi-map were part of the original standard, and they're B-tree-based. But sometimes B-tree isn't what you want. You want a hash-based um, lookup in order to give you essentially constant time lookup, no matter how big uh, the collection, if you're willing to sacrifice an ordering to the collection. And so that was the, um, what originally was called hash set, hash multi-map in a lot of different incompatible implementations was standardized into unordered set, unordered map, unordered multi-map, unordered multi-set. So it's basically a similar interface to the original containers, but it's based on hash tables rather than a B tree. There's no inherent order. Uh, Operations like insert, delete, and lookup are typically faster once the collections get big enough. For small collections, it's not really clear. So you might want to you know, do a lot of measurement on these things. But once you get more than three or 400 elements, the hash-based operations tend to be faster than the B-tree-based operations. So given some of the facilities we've looked at, a lot of the uh, functionality for all the containers can be improved. So Pushback is now overloaded for our value references, so you can move a value into the container. There's also a new family called emplace, which takes advantage of variadic templates instead of actually creating an object and then either moving or copying it. The way emplace works is you provide a set of parameters, and those parameters are passed to the constructor, and the object is constructed in place right in the container. And that's the best of all worlds in terms of performance. So in the pecking order, you know, copying is the worst, moving is better, and placing is best. Um, well, moving is really creating and moving, right? It's not just moving. So in placing is better than instantiating and then moving in. That's the, the, the use case of that. Internally, a lot of the operations can be done with moves rather than copying. We already talked about that. Uh, algorithms like sort can be uh, improved ama amazingly. Um, by the presence of initializer lists, there's now new, um, new alternatives for a lot of the different member functions that take advantage of initializer lists and lambdas and so forth. So some components we didn't cover, regular expressions, tuples, all those are pretty complicated and uh, just beyond the scope. There's also some ancillary objects, like weak pointer is used in conjunction with shared pointer to break cycles um, when, when you need that. There's forward list, which is like the single list, singly linked list. Um, there's new algorithms, like um, the, the ability to uh, have a type of the result of some type of operation. There's ways to wrap references so you can pass them around as objects, because uh, normally they're not something you can grab onto. Type traits, mostly used internally for the library maintenance, but uh, they can be used for clients too. String conversions op operations, little convenience functions like this in the string library. Um, the, the missing copy if has been supplied now. All of, any of. IOTA. I love IOTA because I remember when that was the IOTA 
character on an APL type ball on an IBM Selectric back in the old days. Anyway, it creates a sequence of 1 to n um, and you, to be you know, put into a container or something. That's it. So except for concurrency, which I skipped because it's been covered, uh, let me really just briefly just go through some resources. If you go to my website and my links page, there's all kinds of references to stuff that we've talked about here. There's the Standards Committee. Uh, if you haven't visited isocpp.org, which is Herb Sutter's brainchild, and there's kind of a foundation behind it, that's sort of C++ central. Um, all kinds of good talks are linked there and articles and information. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but this is where I got a lot of information for this talk, is from these various documents. I, of special mention is Scott's overview of the new C++. I do have a copy of it here. It's not like I'm trying to sell it or anything, but this is the only actual commercial product that talks about C++11 features you can go out and buy uh, right now that I know of. So it's a really good thing. You can check it out if you like it. All right. And, okay. Good enough. We're done. Thank you.